may be seated. Our Lord Jesus Christ, we can come to him for every need, every want in life, and we can come to him for the guarantee of life after death. It's a beautiful hymn and one that has great and meaningful words. We come to Jesus. He is the only source and only resource that we have. Tonight we're in Acts chapter 11, starting a new chapter tonight, looking at verses 1 through 3, which is only really a prelude for what is going to happen in chapter 15. We find certain issues, two in number, that come to the forefront in the first three verses of Acts chapter 11, which will then be dealt with in detail when we get to Acts chapter 15, and we'll see the multi-headed hydra of certain heresies that had crept into the church at Jerusalem. Very interesting how Satan seeks to infiltrate and then with doctrine which appears to be true doctrine, strikes and attempts to destroy the church. Doctrine that perhaps was, and in this case is, taught in the Old Testament for national Israel. But as we discussed last week, certain things have been changed and they changed radically on the day of Pentecost and as we expand through the book of Acts to include not only the Jewish males, but as we get to Acts chapter 8, Samaritans who were half Jewish and half Gentile and both males and females are mentioned. And then at the end of Acts chapter 8, the inclusion of the Ethiopian eunuch who was Gentile by birth but Jewish by conversion and yet neither male nor female. And then Acts chapter 10, which is what we are finishing and moving into the next division of the book of Acts, which is Cornelius in his household, 100% Gentiles by birth and by religion. And God brings them all into the body of Christ on a co-equal basis as he begins to spread the gospel, as he had commanded the apostles to do back in Acts chapter 1, being witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. There will be one more group that we find as we move about ten more chapters down into the book of Acts. Another group that will be brought in that missed the boat, uh, that uh, rushed down to the pier but didn't quite make it when the ship sailed. And so there's a boat been sent back for them, and we'll get to them as we get later on into the book of Acts. Last week, you recall, we were looking at the final part of Good News your home, and your friends, and saw the marvelous resource that God has entrusted to each one of us, which can be used for his glory, which is our home, whether it is a a property that we, quote, own, or a rental property. It's a place that God has given to us to use for his glory. Sort of summarizing last week, we saw that hospitality, either given or received, is initially a scary thing to do. We saw that hospitality, either given or received, is initially something out of the ordinary, something we don't normally do. And then we saw that hospitality in some contexts can actually be illegal. Many court cases we talked about with uh, the Alliance Defending Freedom uh, have been dealing with churches where city governments came down hard on them because they were meeting in homes. And here in Acts chapter 10, we saw that it was not just human law, but it was divine law that was in question. He said unto them, Ye know how that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation. He had just walked in to Cornelius' household. The second thing that we learned was that God can change the rules any time he wishes to do so. And then he can require something that he never required before and in fact may have prohibited And we saw that the book of Acts records for us the historical change from the law of Moses to the grace of Christ. And that was the point of Peter's vision at the very opening verses of Acts chapter 10. We are no longer under the law. We are under grace. We are no longer bound by the law as our disciplinarian, but we are now empowered and motivated by the love of Christ and the power of the Spirit of God. And we looked at Galatians chapter 3, We looked at the purpose of the law over in 1 Timothy chapter 5, that it's not the standard for the believer. 
It is instead our Lord Jesus Christ who is our standard because the law was made to condemn the wicked. In fact, Paul says very clearly in 1 Timothy 1.8, we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully, knowing that the law is not made for a righteous man. But for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. The law is not made for a righteous man, and we have been made righteous in Christ. An unlawful use of the law to require either circumcision or dietary restrictions for salvation or sanctification is what we are moving into in chapter 11. Then the third lesson that we learned last week was that God has the right to choose whom he will. Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. The next thing that we learned was that when a man or a woman follows the light that they do have, God will send them more light. In verse 35 we saw, But in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. Which answered the question, Well, what about the heathen that you will sometimes run into when you are trying to witness? God will move heaven and earth to send a missionary to the person who follows the light that they have. And then we learn that God blesses with supernatural power only the proclamation of the gospel. And that was the main content of Peter's message in Acts chapter 10, verses 36 through 44. And so we saw at the end of that chapter what introduces us to this new problem that rises in Acts chapter 11. The Gentiles were actually admitted by God into the body of Christ on a co-equal basis as the Jews without first going through circumcision or learning all the dietary regulations of the Mosaic law. I mean, Peter was in the middle of his sermon, and when he, he got to the point about how we have forgiveness of sins through Christ when we believe on him, the Holy Ghost fell on them. The Holy Ghost didn't tell, tell Peter, now stop in the middle of your sermon, and the first thing you've got to do is convert them to Judaism, and then get them all circumcised, and then give them a crash course on dietary regulations, and then you can continue your sermon, and they can trust Christ and be saved. No, the Holy Ghost fell on them as Peter was speaking. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them that heard the word, and they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. You know, as you look at that, you can tell why they were astonished. They thought that they were a superior group. That if God was going to do anything among the Gentiles, he'd bring them sort of in at a lower level. But God didn't do that. And there were going to be some of the men in that group who had come with Peter from Joppa who were going to make a report back to Jerusalem. Do you know what Peter did? Well, we got some uncomfortable feelings here because Peter actually went into uncircumcised men and ate with them. Isn't that against the law of Moses? How easy it is for us to see the working of God and then decide, well, it cannot be the working of God because after all, there's some pet point that we hold to which perhaps we have not understood fully ourselves and clearly these men didn't. They see the working of the Spirit of God and yet somebody reported Peter to the leadership at Jerusalem as we'll see in a moment. And then we saw that baptism followed salvation. It was not a means of salvation. Peter says, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we. And so that brings us to the first three verses of Acts chapter 11, the message entitled Circumcision and Food Fights. And the apostles and the brethren that were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. And when Peter was come up to Jerusalem, they that were of the circumcision contended with him, saying, 
Thou wentest into men uncircumcised and didst eat with them. Of course, they're assuming that. They're assuming these men are uncircumcised. That would have been a general premise, but of course, they're making an accusation without knowing for sure. But before beginning, I think it's interesting to look at a little statistical analysis about circumcision. Circumcision in the Bible, and I think we have some surprising results. Circumcision is only mentioned in the Old Testament 32 times. I think most of us would have thought it would be mentioned more often in light of the fight that's going on here in chapter 11. But when we get over to the New Testament, we discover it's mentioned 45 times, nearly one and a half times more often than in the Old Testament, which the Old Testament is more than three times longer than the New Testament. So in all those extra chapters of the Old Testament, we only have 32 references to circumcision, but in the New Testament, 45 times. In other words, in terms of the space dedicated to that topic, circumcision was a bigger issue in the New Testament than it was in the Old Testament. Let me say that again. Circumcision was a bigger issue in the New Testament than it was in the Old Testament. In all of the Old Testament. You think about the Old Testament going back to creation and we have at least 4,000 years before the coming of Christ. And even if you take it back only to Abraham, we've got 2,000 years before the coming of Christ. And within the first 20 years of the church, we have it showing up more often than it does in the 2,000 years since the days of Abraham until the coming of Christ. So that should let us know that it's a rather important topic as we get to the New Testament. The next thing that we notice here is it appears that there was, and we've discussed this before, how apparently there was some kind of a spy network in place among the early Christians, even without cell phones, even without the internet. They always seemed to have advanced warning of when something was going on, and we discussed that in some detail as we studied Ananias being commanded to go to Saul in Damascus. Verse 1 here says, And the apostles and brethren that were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. Somebody came and told them. I suspect that that report probably reached Jerusalem during the time that Peter tarried at Caesarea. He commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord, then prayed they him to tarry certain days. You know, while we are busy about the Lord's work, and I've seen this many times in my own ministry, we're busy about the Lord's work. There are other people who are out there gossiping. There are other people who are out there throwing tax on the seats like kids did in school. There are other people who are out there making certain that there is some kind of a rope across the path so that you'll trip on it when you go down the path. It goes with the territory. If you're a person who is diligent about the Lord's service, you will discover that opposition arises, sometimes from places where you don't even expect it. Somebody reported on Peter. There was a tattletale in the group. Now we see that there is a showdown that has to occur concerning the fulfillment of the law. The book of Acts is beating its way through these issues because there was a stubborn resistance that had to be overcome so that we could have the full grace and the gospel of Christ as explained to us in the epistles. So here's our showdown. It didn't happen when the Samaritans had been brought into the body of Christ because the Samaritans practice, and they still practice today, there's still a small group of Samaritans. They practice both ritual circumcision and they practice the ritual dietary laws of Moses. And they have what's called the Samaritan Pentateuch, which they bring out once a year, ancient scrolls of 
the law of Moses and they parade them around and have a big festival. They still do animal sacrifices and uh, they've learned opportunistically to set up bleachers and charge admission for people who want to come and see this. And so you can come and watch the Samaritans do their ritual sacrifices. But we didn't find a showdown when the Samaritans came into the body of Christ on a co-equal basis with the Jews because the Samaritans practice circumcision. The Samaritans practice the law. The Samaritans are meticulous about the dietary rules. It's when Gentiles came in. When Peter was come to Jerusalem, they that were of the circumcision contended with him. Those who were Jewish believers in Jerusalem those were the people who were upset. It was Jewish believers. Peter did not report to the Sanhedrin. Peter did not report to the scribes and Pharisees. He reported back to the church leadership in Jerusalem. This group of Jewish believers would have been obviously offended, but so would, if he had reported to them, they would have arrested him, if he'd reported to the Sanhedrin or to the scribes and the Pharisees. They would probably have pointed to this as a clear violation of the law and sort of said, I told you so, those guys got off on a deep end and now look how far they have gone. We need to remember also in this context some of the very important things that we have seen a little earlier in this book. Peter was the most well-known and most respected apostle. When leaders do something that's out of line, they're always going to be somebody that wants to bring it to the front. If this had been some unknown, unheard of person who was sort of a fringe member of the church at Jerusalem, it probably wouldn't have been recorded for us in the book of Acts. But here we find leadership doing something totally out of the ordinary, at least from their perspective. Peter was clearly one of the best known and most respected apostles. Paul says so in Galatians 2. And when James, Cephas, that's Peter, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go unto the heathen and they unto the circumcision. And that brings us to the second point about Peter. Peter was the apostle to the Jews, whereas Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles. The Jews are called the circumcision, of course, and the Gentiles are called the uncircumcision. And yet here is Peter, the apostle to the Jews, going to Gentiles. I think God did that for a specific reason. You see, if Peter had never had any interaction with Gentiles, and only Paul had interaction with Gentiles, and then Paul not have any interaction with Jews, the argument could be made that there are really two divisions in the church. And there should be a Jewish church, which is under one set of guidelines, and a Gentile church, which is under a different set of guidelines. But God made certain that it was Peter who brought the Gentiles in to the body of Christ. And God made certain that Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles, always first went to the synagogues and preached Christ before he spoke to the Gentiles in all the different cities he went to in his missionary journeys. God was making clear to us that the Jews and Gentiles are now one in Christ. He's broken down the middle wall of partition that used to divide us. He's taken the commandments, the ordinances that were against us and nailed them to his cross. He's made us one in our Savior. That's what we see happening in practical reality here as we're going through Acts. Paul says that he was the apostle to the Gentiles. Romans 11:13. For I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles. I magnify my office. He says to Timothy in 1 Timothy 2.7, Whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle, I speak the truth in Christ and lie, lie not, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. He says in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 11, Whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. 
Galatians chapter 2, verse 7. But contrarywise, they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. Romans chapter 2, verse 25. For circumcision verily profiteth if thou keep the law, but if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made for uncircumcision. Paul is arguing there that those who want to go and insist on circumcision as a religious right, a religious obligation, a requirement, fail to understand its relationship to the law. If you keep the law, all right, circumcision is profitable. But if you break the law, your circumcision is as though you had never been circumcised. And then he reverses that in verse 26. He says, Therefore, if the uncircumcision keep the righteousness of the law, shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? And shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, that is, Gentiles, if it fulfill the law, judge thee, who by the letter and circumcision does transgress the law? It's not good enough to say, do what I say, not what I do. It's not good enough to have a few of the outward evidences if you don't have the internal reality. He moves into chapter 3, and it's interesting because he mentions circumcision not only in chapter 2, but in chapter 3, chapter 4. He mentions it in 1 Corinthians, in Galatians, in Ephesians. In other words, this is something that he writes to many Gentile believers. Romans 3.30, he gives the bottom line principle seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and the uncircumcision through faith. The issue is not the keeping of the law. The issue is faith. He brings us back to the origin of the divine command for circumcision, which is surprising to those who are the Judaizers who were seeking to place believing Jews back under the law, but who had not thought back far enough in their own history. Chapter 4, Paul writes, Cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only, or upon the uncircumcision also? For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. How was it then reckoned? When he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. In other words, if you go back to Genesis, to chapter 12, where Abraham is called, and given the initial statement of promise, and then to chapter 15, where Abraham is given a restatement of promise, and then to Genesis chapter 17, where Abraham is given the statement of the promise again, and then to chapter 21, where the promises to Abraham are stated again, you discover that God made those promises and made the Abrahamic covenant prior to commanding him to circumcise himself and to circumcise all his household. And by the way, among those was Ishmael, who was circumcised at age 13. That was the point at which Abraham and all the males in his household were circumcised. In other words, Abraham had those promises for a long time, had the covenant that God had made for a long time prior to being circumcised. And that's what Paul's point is here in Romans chapter 4. The blessedness came to Abraham not because of circumcision. The blessedness came to Abraham by faith. For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. Paul speaks of it again in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 19. Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing, but the keeping of the commandments of God. In other words, if you want to put that up front, that's not what God considers important. What he, keeps, what he says is important is obedience, keeping the commandments of God. Galatians 5, verse 6, For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love 
There could be those people who might take the opposite side and say, okay, you guys are arguing for circumcision. We're going to argue for uncircumcision. That's what makes us better. You Jews, you pushing for circumcision, we know that that's not what makes you okay. But hey, we're uncircumcised. That's what makes us okay. Paul denies that. He says circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing. In Jesus Christ, neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. In the next chapter, chapter 6 and verse 15, for in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. You see, the book of Galatians, which, by the way, is a very key book in dealing with this particular topic, and when we get to chapter 15, the Lord willing, will deal with it in more detail. But I'm just giving you an overview tonight. The great problem among the churches of Galatia, which were primarily Gentile churches, but Judaizers had come in, and they had brought in this heresy, which is dealt with first here in Acts chapter 11, dealt with again in Acts chapter 15, but it still continued to spread even to the Gentile churches. And that's one of the big issues in the book of Galatians. In Ephesians we read chapter 2 verse 11, Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who were called uncircumcision by that which is called circumcision in the flesh made by hands. It was sort of a... Um, a slander remark like some of the slander that used to go on in our country about certain races with the n-word oh he's only a people you know there's nothing new about racism the Jews even the Jewish believers back at this time still look down their noses at the Gentiles and they say oh yeah they're the uncircumcision." He's an uncircumcised. Oh, you think back all the way back to that, the uncircumcised Philistine Goliath. <laughs> and we find that throughout the scriptures there. That use of that term. But circumcision predates the law of Moses. We find it, Jesus says so in John 7, 22. Moses therefore gave unto you circumcision, not because it is of Moses, but of the fathers. And ye on the Sabbath day circumcise a man. He's going back before Moses, the fathers. That's Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the twelve sons of Jacob. Those are the ones that are called the fathers. We find Stephen giving his defense in Acts chapter 7 makes mention of this. And he, that is Stephen, said, Men, brethren, and fathers, hearken, the God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Haran. And said unto him, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred, and come into the land which I will show thee. And he gave him the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham begat Isaac, and circumcised him the eighth day. And Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat the twelve patriarchs. Those are the fathers. Circumcision was important because it was a sign of faith, not a sign of law-keeping. Romans 4.11 and he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had, yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. The righteousness was imputed by faith. As you know, that's one of the main themes of the book of Romans. As you know, that's where Martin Luther, as he was reading and preparing his notes for teaching on the book of Romans, came across that magnificent statement, the just shall live by faith. Luther had struggled with all kinds of human good works to try to please and appease this angry God that he pictured in heaven. And as he said, it was as though the light of heaven was opened to me when I read that. The just shall live by faith. And in the margin of his Bible he wrote, Sola, alone. 
There is nothing there of relics. There is nothing there of masses. There is nothing there of pilgrimages to Rome. There is nothing of works of penance or works of righteousness to the poor. The just shall live by faith. And that is the main theme that carries us through most of the book of Romans. So the question of circumcision had to be dealt with in Acts chapter 11 at the very beginning because it was going to become the central wedge of a theological division in Acts 15 where two distinct issues were raised. The first issue was the issue of salvation. Acts 15.1 says, And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. They were teaching that circumcision was necessary for salvation. There are those who today parallel circumcision and baptism and say you have to be water baptized in order to be saved. It's the same old heresy all over again, just a different work. Then we find there was a second issue that came up there in Acts chapter 15. Down in verse 5, it was the issue of sanctification. Because here we have people who are real believers. In the first verse, they were teaching salvation by circumcision. It indicates they're not truly saved. But listen to verse 5. It says, but there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees, which believed, saying, that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. You'll discover that every form of legalism has at least two branches. There is Jewish legalism and there is pagan legalism. Jewish legalism requires the keeping of the law of Moses in the area of salvation and in the area of sanctification. One of those is apostasy, one of those is heresy. Pagan legalism requires you to keep some law of man, either for salvation or for sanctification. For salvation, it's apostasy. For sanctification, it's heresy. There are technical distinctions between those two things. Two different words are used in the New Testament, but that summarizes it for you. If someone requires you to keep the law of Moses, any part of it, either for salvation or for sanctification, it's either apostate or heretical Jewish legalism. If someone requires you to keep some ordinance or command of man, either for salvation or for sanctification, it is either pagan apostasy or pagan heresy. And we find both of those issues being raised in Acts chapter 15. And in the early Jewish Christian mind, circumcision was very difficult to sever from keeping the law. So the heretics used this as a wedge to divide the early church. They first had to infiltrate, and then they went out taking others with them. And of course, we find that that's stated both in Acts and in several places else in the New Testament. Acts chapter 15. Here we find the council at Jerusalem dealing with the issues, and we'll talk with it about it more when we get to that chapter. But let me just read you the verse, because it, it points out the key issues here. For as much as we have heard that certain which went out from us troubled you with words, subverting your souls, saying he must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment. They'd been there. They had been infiltrating the group there in Jerusalem. They went out and then they troubled others, subverting their souls by telling them they had to keep the law and be circumcised. John mentions that in 1 John chapter 2. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. 
The Apostle Paul gives a warning in Acts chapter 20 when speaking to the Ephesian elders and says this, For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. And then verse 30, because it gives us a taste of what happened in Jerusalem. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. But that's not the only attack that we see here in the passage or in the subsequent passages that we've just mentioned. The enemy will always try to accuse you of the extreme. Obviously, that's not the way that Paul preached when dealing with weaker brethren, as we'll see in a few moments. But in Acts chapter 21, Paul had been out there preaching, and we see how he preached on that particular issue. But the council at Jerusalem, which had already in chapter 15 made their decision concerning circumcision and concerning certain types of food, which is the second half of our problem, they speak to Paul as he comes back and they say, we have here some men who have a Nazarite vow on them. And to show people exactly what you are teaching and not teaching, would you be willing to go with them as they finish off their Nazarite vow? Now, the Apostle Paul had a Nazarite vow of his own, which he had made and which he completed, a vow which apparently he had taken prior to his salvation, and it lasted for a set period of time where he had to go back to Jerusalem and have his head shaved of the hair that was on his head. We'll talk about that more as we get farther into the book of Acts. Was Paul wrong in doing that? Or was he fulfilling an obligation which he had already made. Oh, there's some interesting things to learn about that and to look at Ecclesiastes chapter 5 and Ecclesiastes chapter 7 and I just uh, whet your appetite, I hope, on that subject. Of what about promises that you made before you were saved? What about covenants that you made before you were saved? Hey, do you get to jump out of those things as soon as you get saved? Well, I'll give you a hint. Suppose two unmarried people, or excuse me, two uh, unsaved people get married. If one of them gets saved, does that mean that they can instantly wipe their hands and walk away? I think you see where that one's going, but we'll wait till we get there. So they, the enemy has accused him, and they say, We're informed of thee that thou teachest all the Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, neither to walk after the customs. We'll wait for a full exposition of that till we get to Acts 21. But after salvation, circumcision should not be a theological issue. Paul says so in his doctrinal epistles, 1 Corinthians 7.18. Is any man called being circumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised. Is any called in uncircumcision? Let him not be circumcised. In other words, after salvation, circumcision should not be a theological issue. Why? Because the externals do not matter as far as our standing, that is, our position in Christ, is concerned. They only matter in certain practical contexts where our testimony is at stake. But first, our position in Christ is not determined by, nor is it lost by, external things. We see that clearly in Colossians 3.11, where there is neither Jew nor Greek, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. He's talking about our position in Christ. There is no difference between us in Christ. Now, there is a, an order of God's creation, because he mentions male and female in here likewise. That is not denied by our position in Christ, standing on a co-equal basis before God. Women are not less than men. Neither are Gentiles less than Jews, or Scythians, or barbarians, or bond, or free. The free men are not greater in their statue, or stature in their position in Christ than those who are slaves. But Christ is all and in all. Now, let's put this down on the practical level. In real life, 
The Jews care about circumcision. That's one of their big things. It still is today. But in real life, unsaved Gentiles almost never care if a man is circumcised unless they are Jew haters. For example, the Nazis and other groups that have tried to eliminate open Jewish identification who have identified Jews in that way and then killed them. For example, I'll give you one historical example. As you know, there is a group of non-canonical, that means non-inspired books, that the Catholic Church puts between the Old Testament and the New Testament, called the Apocrypha. Some of those are historical books. They're not inspired, but they are history. And one of those is 1 Maccabees. And in 1 Maccabees, we see the Romans trying to prevent the Jews from practicing circumcision. 1 Maccabees chapter 1, verses 40, 48, 50, 60, and 62. Specifically, the Romans tried to prevent the Jews from that, and this is a record of it. The dangers of requiring circumcision in a Jewish context. If you put any reliance on circumcision, and some people still do, sadly, in churches, and those among Jewish congregations, you find this popping up. If you put reliance on circumcision, it's like putting reliance on good works, or putting reliance on your baptism, or putting reliance on your church membership, or on some other external, visible work of man. Galatians 5, 2 and 3, Paul writes, Behold, I, Paul, say unto you, that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Now remember the context of Galatians. Understand this statement in context. Paul is fighting against the Judaizers who insisted on keeping all the details of the law, either for salvation or for sanctification. What this statement is not. This is not a statement that says if a man was circumcised as a baby, he is stuck with mandatory obedience to the law. It might sound like that if you pulled these out of context. I testify to every man that is circumcised that he's a debtor to do the whole law. And some guy reads that and he says, Whoa, I didn't have any choice in the matter. When I was a baby, my parents circumcised me. Does that mean I'm a debtor to do the whole law? No, that's out of its context. Doesn't mean that that man is stuck with mandatory obedience to the law because Paul himself was circumcised, but he stood firmly against believers, placing them back under the law. Jesus was circumcised and did not reverse the process as an adult. We know that both were circumcised because the Bible says so. Paul says of himself, Philippians 3.5, circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews as touching the law of Pharisees. We know that Jesus was circumcised, Luke chapter 2, verse 21. And when eight days were accomplished for the circumcising of the child, his name was called Jesus, which was so named of the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Now here we also have to put in a balancing caveat. Externals sometimes do matter in the context of expanding or limiting ministry. Because later on we see the Apostle Paul doing something that if we don't understand this principle, we'll find ourselves wondering what in the world is Paul doing. Here's Timothy. Timothy was half Jewish and half Gentile. His mom was a Jew, his dad was a Gentile. But God had called him to a ministry to Jews. And they knew something about him. Acts chapter 16, verse 3. Him would Paul have to go forth with him and took and circumcised him because of the Jews which were in those quarters, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. Now, folks, that's Acts 16. That's just one chapter after the big fight in Jerusalem. Only one chapter after the heretics had risen up and said, you've got to be circumcised. Some of them said you've got to be circumcised to be saved. Some of them said you've got to be circumcised and keep the law of Moses for sanctification. And in the very next chapter, Paul takes and circumcises Timothy after he had just fought against those pushing for circumcision in chapter 15. Paul was not being inconsistent. 
he was understanding that externals sometimes matter in terms of either expanding your ministry or in terms of contracting your ministry. And he wanted Timothy to go with him. And the first place Paul, every, uh, every time he went anywhere to any city, the first place that he went was always to the synagogue. But when we come to Titus, who was 100% Gentile, in Galatians chapter 2, back to Galatians, where we have that Judaizers problem going on, Paul writes in verse 3, But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. Paul stood against it when there were those who were pushing for Titus to be circumcised. Circumcision is also wrong in certain situations when it is used to escape persecution as a Christian, either one way or the other, either being circumcised or being surgically restored to uncircumcision is wrong if it's being done to escape persecution. Galatians chapter 6, verse 12. As many as desire to make fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. Isn't it amazing? We look back at these things, we think this is not really a problem in the church today, but it was a huge problem in the early church. You say, well then why did God put it into the Bible if it's not going to be a church problem for us? God put it in the Bible because it's teaching us certain principles. We're going to have all kinds of funny things that come up as we go through church history whereby the church is brought to a point of division over things that are really irrelevant to our walk of faith and our position in Christ. And so this gives us illustration of how those things are to be dealt with. The Judaizers who insisted on circumcision and did it for the wrong reasons, which was law-keeping. And they failed to keep the law themselves in the most significant way stated by Jesus. Galatians 6.13, For neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law, but desire to have you circumcised, that they may glory in your flesh. There's a wrong reason. But they missed the really important things. Matthew 23, uh, 23, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, Jesus speaking, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have omitted the weightier matters of the law. You focus on the details. You focus on this little stuff. But you've omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought ye to have done and not to leave the other undone. As a practical matter, there are no morally acceptable ways to determine if a man is circumcised. You can't tell one way or the other unless you use immoral means to do so. As a second practical matter, after we get past the admission of the Gentiles into the body of Christ, the issue of circumcision became a moot question since many and perhaps most Gentile men especially here in America, were circumcised routinely after the hospital births became common. Jewish males were always circumcised on the eighth day by a mohel in recent times, the day that the clotting agent, vitamin K, is highest in the bloodstream of the baby, which was God's provision at creation because he was going to give that command to Abraham and then to the Jews following him. So it clots rather than bleeding profusely. But after the advent, of course, of vitamin K injections, the circumcision of Gentiles could occur as soon after birth as was convenient for the medical staff, and often did occur, even without parental permission, prior to our current health laws. So there are many men in America who are not Jewish, but who are circumcised. But in any event, the New Testament indicates that circumcision is only wrong when it is required for the religious reasons of salvation and sanctification. In fact, it may be surprising to you, but there have been multiple other ancient cultures that practice circumcision, both in the Far East, the Middle East, and in the West. I was only able to do a really brief survey on this, but amazing how many cultures I found, just with a brief survey. 
It was practiced by the Edomites, the Moabites, the Ammonites, the Ishmaelites, those are the Arabs, the ones who descended from Ishmael, who was circumcised when he was 13 years old by Abraham. The Egyptians, the Ethiopians, the Colchians, the Congo blacks, and others in Central Africa. In fact, many different tribes in Central Africa, far removed from anybody, practiced it. Central and South American Indians, the Salivas, the Guamos, the Octamos on the Orinoco, the native Indians in Mexico and the Yucatan Peninsula, and so on. I suppose there are probably others, but I didn't have time to hunt for any more. The Egyptians only allowed pagan priests to be circumcised and those who were initiated into certain pagan mystery religions. But the scripture is silent on whether circumcision is right or wrong for other non-religious reasons. In other words, in those areas, it's a matter of Christian liberty where the individual conscience may be the final arbiter and circumcision may be practiced or abstained from for non religious reasons. So what are some of the non-religious regions? Well, medical and sanitary reasons principally come to mind. There's, of course, a lot of disagreement on that issue, and there have been studies done on both sides of it, published in the medical journals. But you know that's really irrelevant. You don't have to make a decision based on what do the medical professionals think is best right now. It's irrelevant, as we'll note below, but it doesn't matter which side is right. It's a matter of the individual choice and the freedom of conscience that is not burdened by the law of Moses. Sometimes a non-religious reason might require, and I've seen situations like this, a father requiring it prior to giving his daughter in marriage because the father has authority over the daughter and the right to refuse to give her in marriage. And there have been fathers who have said, I'll not let her marry that man because he's uncircumcised. There is also the business of causing a male child to have the same appearance as his father. I know some men who made that decision based on what had happened to them as babies. Then there, of course, is what we've seen already, our testimony to others, for example, Timothy and Titus, and the refusal to cause a stumbling block to those who might misunderstand. There are numerous passages which speak to the issue of the principles involved, not just the specific commands and prohibitions. Let me just give you a couple. James chapter 4, verse 7. Here's the principle. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. That's a general principle that applies to many different areas of life. You come to the conviction that something is the good thing, something that is the right thing, something that God wants you to do. And it's not contrary to Scripture. It's not commanded by Scripture. But you feel that this is something that you know God wants you to do. Now we've gone through the grid. We spent a lot of time on that in the early chapters of the book of Acts. How to determine the will of God. And you go through a whole set of questions for yourself and in the end, if you don't have a definitive answer whereby it's written in the scripture, thou shalt marry Jane, <laughs> you have to apply other principles. And the word of God lays those out for us and we've covered those already so we'll not cover them again here not just looking for specific commands and prohibitions. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Or Romans chapter 14, verse 22. Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is the man that condemneth not himself in that thing which he alloweth. Now, that, of course, gives us a perfect transition to our second part of the message tonight, which I can see, I think our time is up. Can't really see that clock back there in the dark, but I think it says about 7.15, which means our time is up. But that's the transition to the second issue in our text tonight, the issue of kosher food and eating with Gentiles. And the passage that we just read here a moment ago in Romans chapter 14 deals specifically with questionable foods and the conscience. So I'll close with our text, which was Acts 11.3, saying, Thou wentest in to men uncircumcised, and didst eat with them. So the Lord willing, that's where we'll pick up next week. We covered circumcision tonight. We'll cover food fights next week. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you once again for the marvelous Word of God. And there are subjects that we don't like to talk about. They seem too delicate to talk about, and yet <laughs> you dealt with them a lot in the New Testament because they were specific issues that were troubling the believers. And if we don't talk about them, we'll never learn the principles 
that you set out so that we might make determinations based on the word of God instead of just on our own personal feelings. We pray, Father, that you will take those things that we have studied tonight and use them for the glory of your Son, Jesus Christ, in our lives. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn for tonight.